We always get requests for Wagner, but there aren't a lot of Wagner operas that we can do at the level that I think they deserve to be done. One that I would love to do is Tannhäuser, for example, and I simply don't know an ideal Tannhäuser. Although this summer, an Australian is singing the role at Bayreuth, and I'll be watching him to see if he's going to turn out to be the answer to that particular problem. Flying Dutchman doesn't present quite the same casting problems, is a great work and a wonderful introduction to Wagner for anybody who has never heard his works previously. David Edwards is a new director for this company, he's English, and when we first talked about this work a few years ago, I was impressed with the ideas he had. And I think they'll all be realized very well on the stage. It'll be an interesting look, not quite realistic and not quite abstract. It's a wonderful blend of each. This production has been conceived around the idea of the principal character's obsession with a ghost. And I've attempted to focus the whole direction of the show on center and her manic, desperate love affair with an oil painting of the Flying Dutchman. <laughs> This is an oil painting which comes to life. Senta is the first character that we see in the opera, and she makes an entrance, a dramatic entrance, right at the beginning of the overture. And I'm hoping that this will set up for the audience the idea that the whole opera centers around her. And we then see her again before Acts 2 and Act 3. Now, in Act 1 of the opera, she doesn't actually sing. Wagner didn't write her vocal part until the seafarers came home, as it were, in Act 2. But in this production, she is on stage for most of the first act. And again, I'm hoping that that will give the public uh, an anchor, as it were, in her story, and we'll see the narrative through her eyes. <laughs> The lighting for this production is predominantly from the side of the stage rather than from the front. And for me, this gives it a very hard-edged and, and crisp, dramatic outline so that the figures are strongly side-lit and they seem to stand out when you do this against their background. So we light them from the side and we backlight them as well from overhead and from behind. <laughs> Iris is a device that I've put into this production to create a variety of visual backgrounds. And I'm hoping that it will suggest different things to, to different people. For me, it has a resonance of opening and closing, of distant perspective and foreshortened perspective. It gives us a sense of movement and of great depth on the stage. And we're also able, through lighting, to adjust the color on the screen at the back. And I'm hoping that this will give us, as I say, a, a very emotional response behind the singers to, to what they're singing. I was inspired with this, the use of this effect to some extent by the paintings of Mark Rothko because I find them very spiritual and very moving and powerful works of art 
and Rothko's canvases exhibit these enormous spaces of color and they have a depth and an in intensity which I find very powerful. I mean, you can even come this way and work back for, for, for this. In fact, this, yeah, you can work your way back here and then into the sit, maybe from this corner. Does that, does that work all right? Yeah. Probably. I think that R is working, working well. Are you happy with that? Pretty well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Robert Hale is one of America's great, great ba bass baritones. And although a lot of his career has been in Europe, and he's, I think, slightly less well-known in this country than he deserves to be, he, he is a towering figure on the stage. He's a, an artist of incredible intensity. He has a voice to die for. And he has uh, been a wonderful collaborative colleague in what is a slightly new interpretation of, of the part for him. <laughs> For years I've sung this role and uh, only really once or twice did, did I have uh, exciting, really different and uh, uh, from just, uh, many times just stand and sing. And you look convincing, you sing convincingly as you can, but not much movement. And this, this opera, uh, this setting uh, is excellent and I'm very pleased to be working with uh, David, a wonderful director. and uh, he's challenged us and I'm open because I love to do different things in productions uh, that I've done before and I didn't think he, after my 27 or so productions that he would find anything that I haven't done but he has. <laughs> the role is a very compact role it's, uh, it's one of Wagner's shortest operas but it's one of his most difficult operas for the three principles the tenor, the soprano and the, the bass baritone because uh, the tessitura, where it lies, uh, the, is very high and demanding every time you're on the stage, so that uh, it becomes one of the most challenging roles. It is, I consider it the most challenging role I sing from a vocal standpoint, but uh, very rewarding because he wrote some very beautiful music in this. And, uh, it, it's very Italianate. It was early uh, Wagner, and uh, so that it uh, pr presents a wonderful opportunity to sing some very gorgeous and long, beautiful uh, lines that are quite unlike the rest of Wagner. But for the Hollander, it's it's a real challenge, and uh, of course, uh, he, this wonderful Senta uh, Hollander duet is a high point, uh, uh, I think, of the opera as well as the high point for him and for Senta, uh, and uh, exciting building up, building up higher and higher, and uh, it's, a, it's a great role. I, I, I have a, uh, a very close feeling to it. It was uh, my first Wagner uh, that I did uh, com in a complete role, and uh, it, uh, it has done me well. I had a chance to sing it a lot of places. Rita, I've known for a very long time. We've worked together on a number of occasions before and she is a fantastically responsive and active protagonist in this, in this piece. She's taken my idea of, of, of focusing the story on her um, with alacrity and she's playing a very hard driven and possessed character. She's rather an unusual woman. She's in, in her sort of own dream world. She's looked at this picture of the Flying Dutchman for a very, very long time. And now he's materialised. And she's at first not sure if he's there or whether it's just a figment of her imagination. So she's slightly crackers, I think. And um, she sees this extraordinary man 
who's been wandering the seas for 250 years. And the ballad she's sung many, many times has now come into reality for her. And um, I think she's a bit of a crackpot, actually. That's how I see her. She She's an outcast. She's not one of the girls. Um, you know, um, Mari is there with all the girls and they're all spinning away. Um, but she's just rather an unusual person. And she's rather sort of um, pushed out by the rest of, of, of the girls and the women um, who all sing their spinning chorus together. And she's, and she's the outcast. It is a hard thing. It's very hard. It's got to be loud, it's got to be soft, it's got to be beautiful, it's got to be aggressive. It's very high at times, it's very low. And in this production, it's very, very physical. And so there are lots and lots of different sides to the character um, that create difficulties. Uh, but that's why we rehearse and we, we get used to that, hopefully. <laughs> John Kyes is again a very flexible and powerful performer. He said to me at one rehearsal, oh, I love to roll on the floor when I'm singing. And for me, this is a tremendous gift because it means we can be versatile and adaptable and very expressive in the staging. And I found John to be, again, one of those artists who encourages me and inspires me and takes direction from me in the most enterprising fashion. I've done this part a couple times before, so uh, every time I come to a, a new production of uh, a role that I've already done, what I try to do is, is come with um, no preconceived ideas, uh, which sometimes is difficult, but basically to come as a uh, fresh new palette for a conductor and a director to work with. And in this particular case, Karen uh, has been wonderful to work with. We've been finding some new new ideas for, for breaths and things like that uh, on the musical end. Dramatically, uh, I liked the director very much, uh, and we started just by sitting and talking and kind of getting an idea of mm, who could be alive during the time that we're setting this in, what type of person he would be, that type of thing. Seeing a lot of uh, paintings, artwork, uh, which always is very inspiring to bring other uh, forms of art uh, into opera and, and use it as inspiration. Um, so this particular character uh, characterization of Eric that we've come up with is that he's a normal guy. He's, he's not a fisherman, which everyone else is in this opera, basically. Uh, he's a huntsman. Uh, so I think with that, he's a little bit of an outsider, uh, even though he's respected uh, in the community. And he's in love with Zenta. Uh, and the love of this man towards her back in that time uh, is a little different than what we would consider the way you love someone now. It's more, uh, I think, just, okay, she will be good for me, so let's, let's make this happen. 
he happens to not have enough money for her father's taste. The dowry isn't uh, quite big enough, I think, and so the father's still on a, a Dolan is still on a lookout for a, for a richer suitor, uh, which makes me a little bit upset and hurt, angry. And basically, I'm looking for Zenta to feel a passion for me, feel love for me, and to back me up, if you will, uh, to try to say, Dad, I want to marry this guy. And she's in love with the Dutchman, so I have no chance whatsoever. But I'm a glutton for punishment, uh, and I come back for more and more disappointment and rejections. And, uh, and that drives him a little bit crazy. Uh, between the second and the third act, uh, you'll see a change. Uh, he's already a bit agitated when he comes in the second act. Uh, but by the third act, he's kind of flipped a little bit and has made up some fantasies in his mind as to how much she does love him when in fact she's given him no reason uh, to, to even think that. At least that's how we're playing it uh, in this particular production. <laughs> Daniel Samegi is singing the role for the first time. He's a tremendous uh, man of physique and in, imposing um, presence. And he's brought a, a, a wonderful gruff humor to the role. I've encouraged him to be avaricious and greedy with the part, which I feel that Darland very much is. And Daniel has, has seized this, uh, this character and, and has made him into a very flesh and blood, earthly human being. He's very mercenary. He offers his daughter basically for sale. He's rather like Pogne in Meistersinger in that respect. Uh, he, he's giving away his daughter as a prize for a, a, a further event. So I don't find him extremely sympathetic, although when he comes on in the opera, his music is always really jolly for some reason. And we've had a little trouble reconciling those two opposites. Is there a difference between singing Verdi and Wagner? Yeah, there's, there's a big difference. Ver Verdi is really all over the vocal range and with extremes. Um, it's extreme in The Flying Dutchman too, but as we had said, it's rather Italianate, uh, in being one of his earlier works. Uh, he goes to the vocal extremes. Verdi uses all the vocal extremes and goes from top to bottom within three, phrase, two, three notes. And uh, Wagner is a completely linear composer. You just blend into the orchestra, really, and you become a, a part of the whole. It's much easier to sing in that respect. But having said that, I don't think anyone should really attempt it unless they've got the vocal material to do that. And horns, that's the horn bassoon thing that could really cut out forte. It's now 20 years since Karen Keltner made her debut with San Diego Opera. It seems like only yesterday, but it is 20 years. We've watched her grow up in many respects. And to close the season as she does this year with such a major work from such a major composer is very important. It's a way of showing our confidence in her, but also it allows her full reign with her abilities. Okay, third act. <laughs> okay, I think for an audience member who has not attended a Wagner opera before, or who's really maybe been to some smattering of Germanic or German composers, but basically French or Italian, most of all, I would tell them to um, expand their thought of phrase, probably, uh, because the phrases are longer, and to listen and perhaps 
savor to a greater degree, because you have more time to do it, some of the wonderful tonal changes that happen during the course of the unrolling of a phrase, uh, and the colors that uh, are evoked by Wagner's orchestration. One of the most important elements of Wagner's music and Wagner's operatic um, compositions are the elements which are called leitmotifs, and that's a thematic uh, motive sometimes just by one instrument, um, which characterizes or denotes a particular person or character in the opera. And the one that, that we hear right off the bat in The Flying Dutchman is the Dutchman, or the Dutchman ship, whichever way we're thinking of it at a, give, at a given time, his motive, which is pom 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 pom. So the element of the leitmotif is begun in Wagner in the Flying Dutchman, or at least we hear it pretty readily in the Flying Dutchman, and then it's carried much further and much more complexly in the subsequent Wagner operas. <laughs> He's such a smart composer. I must admit, I've always had problems with what I know of Wagner the man, but the more I, I dig into and explore Wagner as, as a performing musician, the more in awe I am of the mind that could conceive what he's conceived and, and orchestrate it so beautifully. Who can't be seduced by the power of the overture, which many times people hear just as, as a piece standing alone. The choruses, the choruses are tremendously powerful and, and uh, exhilarating. Uh, and you know, we have a 65-member uh, uh, ghost chorus, too, in this opera. The, San, uh, the uh, Gay Men's Chorus of San Diego is providing the, our auxiliary chorus. And of course, our chorus is just doing, I think, tremendous work. <laughs> Probably the greatest challenge have been putting the auxiliary chorus with the principal chorus on stage. The auxiliary chorus is, is being supplied by the Gay Men's Chorus of San Diego, and there's 63 of them off stage, and then there's 70 on stage for the main chorus. And putting them all together actually fell together pretty simply. The Gay Men's Chorus is a wonderful structure, is run fabulously. The director, uh, Stephen Austin, is wonderful with them. Had them all prepared before I ever met them. They were actually off book before I had my first rehearsal with them. And it really was just putting them together and letting them hear each other. <laughs> just sing the notes. I mean, the chorus is a character, and they have to be able to be the characters that they are. They have to be able to portray in their voice, through the text, through the line, through the music that was written. Wagner is very, very clear. He writes very clearly the character of 
principal singers as well as the chorus into the music. And they have to portray that as well as just singing the right words and rhythms and notes and dynamics. How do you feel as a Wagnerian singer about the controversy around Wagner and his personal life? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I have given that some thought, but not a lot, or not given too much weight to it. I uh, am born Jewish, which would seem odd given all of that controversy as well. I don't think, I think we should separate the man from his art. His art is great. He's kind of a genius. Uh, when it comes to his artistic life. Uh, and I think in past years, closer to our own time, we've had to separate men's personal lives from their jobs. And I think we need to do that in this case too. The fact that Wagner was perhaps not the most pleasant of individuals is, for me, largely irrelevant. We do that research on, on his character as background, obviously, to staging his works. but. One cannot deny that this man was one of the major geniuses of 19th century music. He wrote his own texts, he wrote his own music, he conducted them, he even built an opera house in which to stage them in, at Bayreuth. And I feel that it's important that everyone gives Wagner a chance as a composer, come and hear the music, come and watch this fantastic story, see what he's got to give us and what message he can tell us, what he can prompt us to think about our world and our times. And these topics are still relevant today. There may be different topics from those that he was originally writing about, but I feel that the, the music and the drama that he creates on the stage has a power that everybody is going to be seduced by if they come and give it a chance. My favorite mo moment is when I'm done. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, you know, the first Check, one. please. <laughs> <laughs>